All right, good morning, everyone. It's a great day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. Uh, please stand and we'll uh, start our worship service with our responsive reading. Our responsive reading for this week is Psalm 18. Psalm 18. If you've got your handouts with you, we'll go ahead and get started. I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God, my rock, in whom I take refuge. My shield and the horn of my salvation. My stronghold. I call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised. So I shall be saved from my enemies. The cords of death encompass me. The torrents of perdition assail me. The cords of Sheol entangled me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. To my God, I cried for help. From his temple he heard my voice, and my cry to re and my cry to him reached his ears. And the earth reeled and rocked. The foundations also of the mountains trembled and quailed, because he was angry. Smoke went out from his nostrils, and devouring fire from his mouth, rolling coals came forth from him. He bowed the heavens and came down. Thick darkness was under his feet. He rode on a cherub and flew. He came swiftly upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his covering around him, his canopy thick clouds dark with water. Out of the brightness before him broke through his clouds hailstones and coals of fire. The Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the Most High uttered his voice. And he sent out his arrows and scattered them, he flashed forth lightnings and routed them. Then the channels of the sea were seen, and the foundations of the world were laid bare your feet. At the blast of the breath of your nostrils, he reached down from on high. He took me, he drew me out of mighty waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy and from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out of the broad place. He delivered me because he has delighted in me. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands, he recompensed me. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to come together. Lord, please be with us. Forgive us of our sins and let us stand before you. You are our rock. You are our refuge. You are the horn of our salvation. Be with us, Jesus. Fill this place with the Holy Spirit. Be with the gifts that we receive today. We bless them. That we may use them as a church to continue to be a light in the darkness and to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. Lord, bless them with the givers of those gifts. That they give with a generous and cheerful heart, knowing that all things come from you and all things will return to you. Lord, we have many things on our prayer list that we've been praying for and many people that we're praying for. Lord, and we lift all of them up to you. Be with them, Lord Jesus, and be with their families. And for the prayer requests that are in our hearts that have gone unspoken, Lord, we lift those up to you as well. Know that in all things, Lord Jesus, we love you. And be with us this day. We ask for this in your precious name. Amen. First reading for today is going to be out of Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. We're going to read verses 1 through 12. The title for this message is He Has Arrived. As we're here at the second week of Advent, and I think you'll you'll understand pretty quickly why He Has Arrived is the title of this message. And we're going to read Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. So if you have your Bibles open and you want to follow along, follow along. Uh, Matthew chapter 3, starting at verse 1. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and all the whole region of the Jordan, confessing their sins. 
They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing them, he said, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think that you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees. And every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I am, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering the wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that the scriptures are the authority in our lives. Lord Jesus, fill this place with the Holy Spirit. Fill our hearts with the Holy Spirit, that it may be tender to the leading of your word. And fill our minds and our ears with the Holy Spirit, that we may be attentive to your word, that we may learn your word, that we may love your word, and that we may live your word. And we ask for this in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. So this story, in a way, or there's words in the story that remind me of a trip I took to Italy in 1993. So in 1993, I was 20 years old. And it was the first time that I went to Italy by myself. At that time, when I turned 20, my dad felt comfortable leaving me to run the restaurant. So the plan that we had made was that my dad was going to go to Italy from the middle of June to the middle of July. And I would stay here and run the restaurant. And then he would get back, and I would go to Italy from the middle of July to the end of August and spend my time there. And my grandparents were going to be there, so my grandparents were going with me, right? Now, I had the extra special plan that year. My buddy Fabrizio lived in Rome, and I was going to stay with him and his family for a week. And then my grandparents were going to fly in. I was going to join them in Rome. See, our family's from Sicily. So your, your choices are you either got to fly to Milan or fly to Rome, and then you take a plane down to Sicily or a train down, right? We did Rome. My grandparents were going to fly to Rome, and I was going to meet them on the flight to Rome and then fly down to Sicily with my grandparents, okay? Although going with my grandparents was really like going by myself because other than cooking and cleaning for me, my grandparents were just, they were the best. I, I, I could do whatever I wanted with my grandparents around, right? So my parents go, I run the restaurant. Comes time for me to go, and I am so excited to go. And I go and I get to Rome, and my buddy's there, and his parents are there, his sister's there. We just have the greatest week ever while we're in Rome, okay? Greatest week. We just had a great time. Day comes that we got to fly out. Me and my buddy were out way too late. We set our alarms, and we overslept our alarms. I get up. I'm thinking, there is no way I'm going to make this flight. Now, there were no cell phones back then. I couldn't get a hold of my grandparents. I couldn't do anything, right? My buddy Fabrizio was like, no, no, dude, we're making this flight. Now, this was before 9-11, so security at airports was not like the way security is now. Like, you could, you could rush at the airport if you had to back then. It's pretty tough to do that now. So we pull up, and we're flying through Rome. It's crazy. We pull up to the airport, and literally, I'm getting out of the car, and I looked at my watch, and it was 20 minutes before the plane was supposed to take off. And he was like, go, go, you'll make it, you'll make it. I'm like, all right, so I'm like running in, right? And I run in, I go up to the desk, I have my, my passport, I got my ticket. The lady goes, you're Vince Valtempe? She said, I said, yeah. He goes, hold on. She picks up a phone and she goes, e arrivato, which means he has arrived. And I thought, what the heck does that mean? As I'm turning around, a car comes pulling up. This guy goes, hurry up and jump in. You gotta make this plane. I'm like, okay. So I hop in this cart. We are flying through the concourse of the airport. I mean, this thing is just trucking, okay? We get up to the gate, and then when we got to Rome, right, or when we got to the gate, Rome Airport was one of those ones where you don't board the plane from the gate. You then get on a bus, and the bus takes you out to the plane, and the plane is out on the tarmac, and then you go up the big steps to get on the plane, okay? 
So he's like, hurry up, there's a bus out there. I get on the bus, I'm the only one on the bus. I'm like, what is going on? I get on the bus, this bus is trucking. I'm looking at my watch and the plane was supposed to take off in seven minutes. Pulls me up to the, to the stairs, the bus driver says, hurry up and get up those stairs. So I go up those stairs, I get up there, there's a male uh, flight attendant standing at the door, he checks my boarding pass, he looks at me and straight up he goes, menos mal que se activado, which means, thank the Lord that you made it. And I'm like, well this is odd. I walk into the plane, cockpit's right here to my left, all the seats are down here, and we were like in row 28, okay, all the way down. As I walk in and I turn, everyone is seating. From the very back, I see my little short grandma stand up and go, Vincenzo, Vince. I'm like, what? And everyone on the plane starts clapping. I'm like, what? I walk down there and my grandma's like, she, and she's shaking. She's like, oh my gosh, I thought we were dead. I didn't know. I thought I was going to have to tell your dad I couldn't find you in Rome and you were lost and you were kidnapped or killed. I'm like, no, Grandma. I'm just running late. And the, the flight attendant comes over to me and he says, thank goodness you showed up because she would not let this plane take off without you on the plane. <laughs> the chuckle he says I looked at your grandma and I said it, it's okay lady how old is your grandson she I said he said from the way she was acting I thought maybe you know it was an eight-year-old or a nine-year-old when she <laughs> told me he's 20 I said senora no no not paura. lady don't worry about it your grandson is having a good time in Rome he's fine <laughs> but I, I that that line of that first lady saying to me yeah He's arrived. It has stuck with me for 26 years. It has stuck with me. That line, e arrivato, e arrivato. He has arrived, right? He has arrived. And it fits perfect with, with what we're talking about here. By the way, I wish my grandma were still alive because if you knew my grandma, oof, man, does that story ring true. I mean, just to let you know, that entire month, there were nights where I would get home and, two, three, four in the morning from hanging out with my friends and stuff. And we, we weren't doing nothing bad. We're in a small town. I mean, we would just be out all night. We'd never see each other. And I would get home. It didn't matter how late I was. And I could see the shadow of my grandma sitting up in bed just saying, boy, oh boy, oh boy, <laughs> every night, you know? She was always worried about me. Um, but Andy Bago, right? He has arrived. He has arrived. Brothers and sisters, we've now come to the second Sunday of Advent. And Advent is a time for soul searching. It's a time for looking forward. It, it's a time of hope. And it's a time of preparation, right? It's a time of preparation. But instead of solely preparing for Christmas as many think, it's a time that we should also be preparing for the return of Jesus Christ. The truth is, too often we just don't do that. And it's not necessarily that we don't want to do that. I, I don't think that's the reason. But I think that it's just more comfortable to hold a little baby Jesus, like Ricky Bobby used to talk about all the time, right? I just think it's more comfortable to hold a little baby Jesus in a cute manger with cattle and sheep that are cooing than to face the returning judgment of the king. Um, the king who, who's going to judge not only the living, but he's going to judge the living and the dead. As totally awesome as Christmas is, and the whole season heading up to it, we have to constantly remind ourselves as Christians that Jesus is no longer a little baby in the arms of Mary. Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, is the one appointed King of kings and Lord of lords. Therefore, we must prepare for this reality. We must constantly prepare. We must constantly be roused to returning to the Lord. We must constantly encourage ourselves and each other into this reality. The gospel account that we read this morning from the gospel of Matthew, and we are, we are introduced at this point to John the Baptist. And a very interesting note, Matthew and John give the most extensive accounts of John the Baptist's ministry. 
Mark and Luke give far shorter accounts of John's significance. Furthermore, across all the Gospels, um, the way that John the Baptist is introduced also varies. If we look at the Gospel of Luke, for example, we have great detail of John's conception and birth, right? And the first witness of Jesus, which was John when he was still, um, while his mother was still pregnant, right? Well, while he was still in the womb, who, who leapt at the presence of Jesus. Here in Matthew's account, John the Baptist just seems to appear on the scene. It's like he just said, yeah, he bothered. He, he's arrived. There's no preparation for the reader, for his appearance or his ministry. He just suddenly appears. In fact, the Greek word that's used there, Cain, paragenoima, is in the present tense. What that's meant to do is to, to draw you into the story as if you're just aware of the events that have happened. Like, poof, there's John. And he's out in the Jordan. Matthew uses this same verb and same tense in the latter half of this chapter to describe the appearance of Jesus. Jesus arrived. Had him out. He's here. So here we see Matthew who describes John as being in the wilderness. He's, he's clothed in an animal skin and he's wearing a leather belt. And understand that to the reader of that day, this would have immediately conjured up the image of Elijah and Elijah's clothing. And the original audience of this gospel would have immediately made the connection of John the Baptist to Elijah. You see, Elijah had spent an extensive amount of time in the wilderness hiding from Ahab and Jezebel. But unlike Elijah, who ate the flesh of unclean ravens during his time, John, who was a Nazarite, right? His mother consecrated him as a Nazarite, which means he took this vow of purity. There were certain things that John would not eat, right? And he would not cut his hair, that kind of thing. Samson, for instance, had taken a Nazarite vow before, you know, he decided to run off with Delilah and all that stuff. I don't want to get us off track. But there were certain things that John would not do, right? Certain things John would not do. But the oath was, in essence, to remain ceremonially clean. So instead, he ate wild honey and locusts, or perhaps he even ate the honeycomb, right? I don't know. Have any of you guys eaten locusts before? I ate some with chocolate on them once. And with chocolate on them, you really can't tell. It's just kind of a crunchy, weird thing, but whatever. I don't know that I would make that my only meal. <laughs> I'll say that. But recall what we covered in the last few weeks, well, maybe a month ago now in Malachi, that Malachi prophesied the coming of Elijah, who would prepare for the sudden, sudden appearance, right? The Ahivago moment of the Lord. And as we see here, and we'll see later on in the Gospels, Jesus explicitly makes the connection between John the Baptist and Elijah. He explicitly makes that connection. But, brothers and sisters, what, what's even more important than John's appearance is John's message, right? That, that's even more important. John the Baptist is fulfilling Isaiah 40 by preaching in the wilderness and telling Israel to make their paths straight. His message was actually rather simple. What was John's message? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Repent. This was it. It was go time, to quote Mr. Mandelbaum. This was the time to prepare for a new reality. i got to update that illustration. Mr. Mandelbaum was from Seinfeld, and I know that that's already like 30 years old, which I forget. But it's go time. When, when John shows up, when, when we have that Eahirado moment, it's go time. It was in this sense of preparing for the first advent of the Messiah. But tragically, far too many who were there were not prepared. And tragically, far too many missed it. And understand that when I say they missed it, it's more than just being in the wrong place at the wrong time. This was a matter of not having your heart right before God. They missed it spiritually. And the message of repentance is the same message that Jesus would preach. It's the same message 
that Peter preached at Pentecost when his audience was, was pricked in the heart. It's the same message that is preached in Hebrews 6 and the ABCs of the faith. Brothers and sisters, preaching repentance comes first. And this is true of our witness with Jesus Christ as well. In the Hebrew sense, to repent means to turn. It means to turn. The Jewish term for repentance, teshiva, generally is accepted to literally mean a, a returning, right? A returning. Um, it, it's like returning to, to God's demands. It's like returning to God in contrition, right? The image that I always think about is the prodigal son who at a certain point decides, I'm going back home, right? He, he repents. He goes back home. From an old Jewish Midrash teaching, the Midrash is a, is a, a book of Jewish teachings and instructions and stuff like that. It has this illustration. One who does teshuva, one, one who repents, is considered as if he went to Jerusalem, rebuilt the temple, erected the altar, and offered all of the sacrifices ordained by the Torah. For the psalm says, the sacrifice of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. So when someone repents, you almost get this idea that they're going back and they're rebuilding the temple. And they're re-offering the sacrifice. But in this sense, it's, it's your spiritual life that's repenting and changing. If we take it even a bit further, in Hebrew theology, Hebrew theology is what we would call a, a walled two-way theology. So think about, it, think about it like this. Think about it like a road that has two destinations. One way goes to God, the other way goes to hell. So to repent is to acknowledge that you're going the wrong way and you want to turn and start going the right way. Now in Greek thought, similar but a little different, a little different, repentance involves listening to all of the facts and then making the right choice. When you choose the right alternative, you're repenting. And in what we read today, both ideas are at play. Because when we read about repentance, when we preach repentance, when we live and experience repentance, it is in essence to lay out all the facts, to understand all of the consequences involved, to make the right decision, and to turn and go the right way. And when we turn and go to God, right, we turn 180 degrees. So we're going in the opposite direction. We don't want to turn 360 degrees. That just gets you right back to where you were. Brothers and sisters, even though John was in the wilderness, and I need to explain that. When you read in the Bible, so-and-so was in the wilderness, okay? The wilderness was a scary place, okay, back then. I don't consider the wilderness as like your favorite spot in the woods where you can have your coffee and wait for the deer to come by, okay? Like, my buddy Jay, who just came back from, from a, a week down at the cabin, that, that would have been considered extravagant living in biblical times. That is not the wilderness. The wilderness is a scary place. The wilderness is a place that had wild and ferocious animals. The wilderness was a place that had bandits that was away from, from any kind of law enforcement or anything like that. You had to be scared to be out in the wilderness. Okay, that's why when you hear in the scriptures of people say, like, they look at going to the wilderness like, no, I don't want to go to the wilderness. That's a bad place. So John was out in the wilderness, in the scary place, and yet somehow the word about his preaching got out. And now some might think that if one wants to be heard, he should have gone to Jerusalem. He should go to the big city, Right? To, to preach this message, not in the, in the backwoods of the wilderness of Galilee. I promise you, if John would have consulted with some church planning experts, they would not have told him, hey, you want to build a good ministry, go out into the wilderness. They wouldn't have told him that at all. But that's not how God works. You need to understand that it is faith in God to make the ministry work. 
And when the crowd shows up, the crowd shows up because God draws the crowd. Right? John had to do one thing and one thing only. And you know what that was? John had to be faithful to God. And God would take care of everything else. All John had to do was appear. And then God would take care of everything else. So what happened? The crowds came. And the crowds didn't just come from the Galilee. They came from Jerusalem proper. They came from all the surrounding areas of Judea. They came from the areas beyond the Jordan River to hear John. The use of the Greek imperfect there, they were being baptized, gives us the impression of a constant stream of people coming to be baptized over a period of time. This wasn't just a one-time, he wasn't just out there for an afternoon. This was a constant thing that was going on. And while they were being baptized, it says they were also confessing their sins. This was the baptism of John who baptized at the Jordan River. And there's a lot of symbolism here. Those who were baptized came out of Israel and passed through the Jordan back into the Promised Land. The children of Israel had passed through the same water a thousand years earlier, but when they passed through it, God had made it dry. Here they were baptized in water. So now they were truly Israelites. They were physical descendants of Israel. This was true. However, they weren't children of the promise yet. Brothers and sisters, God's true Israelites are those who are specially prepared. They are transformed. And that transformation begins with repentance. It begins with repentance. It begins with the confession of their sins. And then repentance follows. And understand, the concept of water baptism was not new. Ceremonial cleansing with water was practiced among the Israelites already and particularly amongst a group of Israelites known as the Essenes, of which John was associated with. Baptism was also prescribed to Gentile converts of Judaism. So when a convert submitted to baptism, they were essentially confessing themselves to be Gentiles. They weren't Israelites before, but then afterwards they were. This required a great deal of humility on one's part. And if you think about it, that's true of baptism today. There are some who come to church from outside who aren't associated with that want to be baptized and brought in. But there comes a time for those raised in the church to confess that they're sinners and in need of God's saving grace individually. Everyone, regardless of being raised in the church or not, has to repent and turn to follow Jesus. And here's why. From our passage this morning, one thing is clearly certain. Not all who came to the wilderness were prepared to accept the conditions given and repent. It says that many Sadducees and Pharisees came to see what was going on. But does that mean they were just there to observe? observe? Were they just there to be baptized because it was the cool thing to do and, and everybody else was doing it? We're not really sure, but at any rate, John the Baptist doesn't spare them at all. John the Baptist says, you generation of vipers, who warned you to escape the coming wrath? If you think about it, that is a far cry from the greetings that we give to people who walk into our churches for the first time. Could you imagine someone walking into church for the first time and then just saying, who warned you of the... Have a good day. <laughs> and they take off. But John, he could hardly have been more offensive in greeting the Pharisees and the, and the Sadducees, both of whom were so proud of their uprightness and status in society. To call a Jew a snake, to call a Jew a viper, no less, was equivalent to calling them the offspring of Satan. After all, it was Satan who as a serpent beguiled Eve in the Garden of Eden. Furthermore, the Bible says that before one is born again, all people are sinful and depraved. Because it is only the grace offered to them, to offer to us in Jesus Christ, and the gift of faith that transforms us into the children of God. 
We who were once afar off, we who were strangers to the covenant through repentance and grace and faith in Jesus Christ are then made children of God. I love the quote of Jonathan Edwards who said, I contribute nothing to my salvation except the sin that makes it necessary. I contribute nothing to my salvation except the sin that makes it necessary. And John doesn't just leave them with this insult either. He tells them that if they had really come for baptism, they must first repent. Because you see, baptism isn't just a cutesy thing that we do when we christen our churches. In churches that practice infant baptism, for instance, it's a strict charge that's given to the pastor and to the church and to the parents of that child that they will be diligent in bringing them up in the Christian faith. And in churches that practice believer's baptism, it is a symbol of an inward change of life that now becomes an outward reality. Because, brothers and sisters, if circumcision can become uncircumcision when, uh, when it's not mixed with faith for the Jew, which is what Paul says in Galatians, then baptism can become unbaptism for the Christian when it's not mixed with faith. If you don't have faith, if you don't have change, and you just go and get baptized, it's, almost, it's worse. It's worse than if you hadn't gone at all. By submitting to baptism, a person is confessing a saving faith in Jesus Christ and a pledge to follow him in obedience. If you guys see Pastor Kelsey, I know he's not here in the morning. I, I, I was sitting in his church when I was still dating Lori, and he told the story about how he went up to baptize, to get baptized because he, just because, right? I think he was with your mom. He was with Joey, right? And everybody was going up, so he went up too. And he tells the story all the time. He goes, I went into that water a dry sinner, and I came out of that water a wet sinner because I didn't understand what I had just done. That's not the point of getting baptized. Since I'm on a roll with all of my old illustrations, getting baptized and making the commitment a little bit reminds me of the Karate Kid. When daniel son is with Mr. Miyagi, Mr. Miyagi says, I promise teach to the best of my ability. You promise learn to the best of your ability. If not, who are we fooling? You get baptized without an inward change, without that relationship with Jesus Christ? Who do you think you're fooling? You might get some high fives from your friends, but nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. When Lori broke up with me, she did break up with me at one point before we got engaged. I was so upset. I took all the money that I had saved up for the engagement ring, and I decided to soup up my car. I had a Ford Tempo. A Ford Tempo. I spent... $1,500 souping up the suspension on that car. I would have been so much better off to take $1,500, start a fire, and roast a hot dog over it. It was the biggest waste of money. You know why? Because I had a $1,500 suspension on a car that couldn't drive fast with a driver who didn't drive fast. So who was I fooling? I didn't fool anybody. You know who I fooled? I fooled myself. I fooled myself a couple years later when I said to myself, that's the stupidest thing you ever did. We get baptized, we do these kinds of things without a change of heart, without faith and repentance. Who are you fooling? Brothers and sisters, John gives us the core of what it means to be baptized. And the core is when he says, produce fruit that proves your repentance. Produce fruit that proves your repentance. Jesus also says as much in the Sermon on the Mount. Actually, so does the rest of the New Testament. And we should too. We must not assume that because we were raised in the church, we're automatically God's children. The Sadducees and the Pharisees, they were all right just because they had been raised either in proximity to the temple or in the major synagogues of Jerusalem. They thought that just being a child of Abraham was good enough. Honestly, how they ever got that idea is quite amazing. 
Because the Old Testament teaches the same thing that John the Baptist, Jesus, the apostles, and the church would eventually teach. That there is a necessity for repentance and faith. There's actually three things that you need in order to assure your salvation. We always say blessed assurance, right? That blessed assurance comes when you know. And you know how you can know? There's three ways. That you have faith, that you have repentance, faith in Jesus, repentance of your sin, and you're producing fruit. And all three need to be present. And let's break that down a little bit. If you claim faith in Jesus, right, and you claim repentance, but you produce no fruit, right, you produce no fruit, then someone can question, is your faith and repentance really true? Right? You have no proof. You have no proof to show that. If you have faith and fruit, but no repentance, right? So you're not, you, you're not changing your life. You're, you have faith in Jesus, and you're doing good works, but you haven't changed your life. Well, then what, what are we dealing with? Now we're dealing with a hypocrite. Right? Now we're dealing with a hypocrite. Who, who, who practices, it's good for me, but not for thee, right? And if you have repentance and fruit, but no faith, so you're a good guy that does good things, then you're not saved. All three have to be present. Faith, repentance, and, get, and, and fruit. All three. And a lot of people say, what is fruit? Well, what is fruit? That depends on the person. That's individual on the person. Having fruit doesn't mean I believe in Jesus next week I'm going to be preaching. It doesn't mean I believe in Jesus next week I'm going to be leading worship or, or going off being a missionary. I learned that lesson pretty early on because I was in a, in a, uh, a class to join the church where I first got saved. And there was a lady in there. Now remember, I'm a young Christian. You know what young Christians are like? We're a little bit annoying. Okay? We're like little kids. And I was all on fire for God and I was ready to go. And there was a lady in there who was joining the church that had been married to her husband for 40 years. He had been a pastor for 30 years and he was retired, but they had never officially joined a church. Her name was Mrs. Fish. I still remember her. And I thought she was the meanest old lady ever. I thought, seriously, I thought she must be putting vinegar on her cornflakes in the morning because she was a very, very mean person. And I told my buddy Chad, I said, Chad, what kind of fruit am I seeing in this lady? She's like the, the, the meanest lady ever. And he said, slow down there, young Christian. I said, what? He goes, you don't know anything about this lady. I said, okay. He said, maybe before she came to Christ, she was so upset and so mean she could never leave the house. So the fact that she's even going into a place and sitting with people and communicating is tremendous growth for her. And that's big fruit for her. And I said, Chad, you're right. I shouldn't have said nothing. I'm sorry. I still remember that to this day. It's different for everybody. But there has to be, nobody, guys, as you're reading your Bibles, notice nobody encounters Jesus in the scripture. Nobody encounters Jesus in the scripture and doesn't change somehow. Nobody. Nobody. So faith, repentance, and fruit. Those three things are needed. And that's what John is calling for here. Also, John the Baptist follows the former prophets and prophesying the inclusion of the Gentiles. But the Sadducees and Pharisees made Gentile conversion excruciatingly difficult. In most cases, the families had to adhere to Judaism for generations upon generations before being included. As a result, you had many people who feared Yahweh, but not a lot of converts. But as we hear John clearly proclaim, God can raise up rocks to be his chosen people if the Jews didn't turn to him. God had his axe out and ready, and he had his winnowing fork out and ready, and was ready to chop down and is ready to chop down dead wood, non-producing wood, and throw it into the fire. This was a dire warning to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and it should be a dire warning for all of us here today, too. It should be a dire warning. John finishes the message by telling of the coming one, that one is coming, 
as the Lord of the covenant that Malachi talks about. Malachi said that the Lord would come suddenly. He would just appear in the temple. He just would appear. He was supposedly the one they would delight in. The one that they wanted to come. However, as we clearly see and will see, they were unprepared for Jesus. He came with a winnowing fork. He came to purify the sons of Levi, that they might leave an offering of righteousness. And if they rejected the coming Lord, he would smite the land with a curse. And that curse happened. They would feel it in 70 AD when Jerusalem was destroyed along with its glorious temple. The surviving Jews were made slaves in order to take down the temple stone by stone until not one laid on top of the other. Brothers and sisters, I want you to consider this. If they rejected John mes John's message of judgment, how would they fare when one far greater than John came? The answer is not well for a lot of them. Let's make it even more personal. If people reject our testimony of Jesus, how are they going to fare when Jesus comes back the second time? So brothers and sisters, this is a season of Advent, and it should serve as a time of hope, time of preparation, and a time of warning for us. And the warning is to get our spiritual house in order. Right? To get our spiritual house in order. Let's be ready, brothers and sisters. Let's not waste so much time and let's not waste so much effort on the undercards of life that we miss the moon in that. Right? Let's not waste time on those things and then end up missing the most important thing to come. It's time to make ourselves right, brothers and sisters. And that time to make ourselves right is now. Let's bow our heads and we're going to pray as we get ready for communion. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. Lord, as, as we are uh, coming up on the celebration of your birth, Lord, make us right. Lord, please forgive us of your sins. Lord, if there's anyone here that hasn't placed their faith in you, let today be the day when they come to you and say, Lord, I believe in you, Lord. I believe in you. Help me believe in you more. And let today be the day that we truly repent. That we say, I'm putting my old self behind me and I am following you, Lord Jesus. Please be with us, Lord. Help us in everything and wipe us clean and prepare us. Lord, we're going to celebrate communion now. And we pray, Lord Jesus, that you would, that you would allow us to be counted worthy to share this with you. We love you, Lord, and we ask for this in your name. Amen. If you guys have your little communion things ready, do you want to get, you get one? Go to the back. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, we pray that you would bless and be with these elements, that you would come over them, Lord God, that your Holy Spirit would be around them and surround them, that as we that as we take these elements, Father God, we would be ever reminded of your sacrifice on the cross. Lord Jesus, we love you. Be with us. We ask for this in your name. Amen. So on the night that Jesus was betrayed, on the night where Jesus knew that he was going to be crucified, he had dinner with his disciples, with those that were closest to him. And at a certain point in the meal, he looked at them and he took the bread. And he raised the bread to heaven. And he gave thanks to God for the bread. And then he turned to all of the disciples and he said, This is my body, broken for you. Do this, and when you do, remember me. We can all take the bread. Afterwards, he took the cup, and again he raised the cup to heaven, and he gave thanks to God for the cup, and then he turned to the apostles and he said, this is the cup of my blood, the blood of a new and everlasting covenant, 
it will be shed for you and for all so that sins may be forgiven. Do this, and when you do, remember me. Let's take it. Lord, as we take this cup and as we take this bread, we pray that you would bless and be with us. We pray that it would be a, a constant reminder of your sacrifice. We pray that we would be constantly reminded of the most wonderful Christmas gift that we ever received, which was you arriving here, Lord God. You becoming our Emmanuel, our God with us. And we love you, Lord. And as we close our service this week, Lord, we pray that you would bless and be with us. We pray that you would put it into our hearts to remember how you may just arrive and help us to be ready through our lives. And Lord, as we close this time in prayer, we all pray together in the words that you taught us, Lord, and if you know the words, please pray along with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Have a wonderful week. Have a wonderful Sunday. And Lord willing, we'll see each other again next week.